So what I'm going to uh, talk to you today is, uh, is a talk divided in, in two parts. So the first part uh, is about the discovery, actually, of this process uh, called Tiagre Retrograde Transport. And the second part is going to be about some data that we published very recently, a few months ago, on the effect of oxidative stress on this pathway. So um, how many, st uh, I guess, some students here, yeah? I suppose many of you. Okay, so just to uh, very briefly summarize and uh, what tRNA uh, are, I mean, we know transfer tRNA, there are about 75, uh, 72 to 75 nucleotides, single-stranded RNA, short RNA, and if you uh, look at them in the sort of 2D structure, they form this uh, classical coverleaf. Uh, structure you see here, there's a CCA end here is necessary for actually the charging of the tRNA, so that the amino acid is actually uh, linked to the uh, to the free prime end of the tRNA through the CCA, uh, and then uh, because of base pairing, it forms this uh, covenant structure like that. This is the anticodon loop, and this is where the amino acid, the triplet, is actually recognized on the messenger RNA, and the cognate amino acid. Uh, is brought uh, in by the tRNA. So this structure actually folds into a 3D structure, and this is like an L, an in inverted L like that, uh, because the two loops actually come together, and this is the structure, and this is the anticodon loop. So the anticodon recognizes the, the, tri the triplet here along the messenger RNA, and the tRNA is uh, brought along, is the three sites in the ribosomes, and uh, by covalent bonding, the polypeptide is formed, uh, and then the tRNA is released at the end once the new uh, covalent bond is formed and the polypeptide the tRNA is exhausted its role and is ejected from the ribosome. So essentially, uh, tRNA are fundamental for protein synthesis. They are uh, processed, so they don't come out just like that. Uh, they are synthesized in the nucleus by <laughs> RNAs polymerase 3, and there are many tRNA genes dispersed throughout the uh, entire genome. So, of course, we have 21 amino acids, but in fact, we have many more tRNAs. Uh, and also, uh, we have the same sort of uh, anti uh, same codon uh, tRNA that is coded by many different genes. Uh, so, RNA poll uh, transcribed the tRNA, and they are processed, um, mostly in the nucleolus, actually, where they're made. And they're processed, though, so, uh, uh, free prime and free prime are, are, are chopped, are cleaved and the CCA tail is added by an enzyme into the nucleus, and actually it can happen also in the cytoplasm, but uh, the actual processing happens in the nucleus for mammalian, mammalian tRNAs. The splicing for certain tRNAs, not all of them, but some of them are spliced, and the interesting thing about uh, yeast cells is that the splicing remarkably takes place in the on the surface of the mitochondria, so in the cytoplasm. Uh, but for mammalian, for mammalian tRNAs, that's happening in the nucleus. And then, uh, once the tRNA is matured, because um, modifications are added at particular places in the tRNA, uh, mostly, most modifications are actually methylations, but there are other modifications as well, so the tRNA is, is quite modified. And once it's mature, it's recognized by export factors. So obviously the tRNA must go from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, they have to get out. And they are recognized by uh, particular nuclear transport uh, factors. One of them is called exporting T, tRNA. And uh, it's a quite a picky nuclear transport factor because it recognizes a mature tRNA and a mature tRNA that has to have the CCA tail. If it doesn't have the CCA tail at free prime end, exporting T will not recognize the tRNA, will not export it out. But cells have a backup mechanism, and there's exporting 5 as well as exporting T, and that is a bit more promiscuous and will be able to export tRNA that are not fully, fully formed. Um, okay, so that's the, the process. Then t we know tRNA function in protein translation. They are degraded in the cytoplasm. Some of them are fairly long half-life, uh, uh, 48, 72 hours. Uh, and then they are degraded. And that's the end. Okay? That was the sort of concept, concept in cell biology. Um, but is it really? Is it really the end? So I have to step back a little while, a little bit uh, in, in time, and we were looking for nuclear transport factor that would promote the nuclear transport of HIV into the nucleus. So HIV is a retrovirus, and it has to get into the nucleus to integrate, and it can infect cells that are not dividing. Therefore, there must be mechanism that allow HIV, the HIV is exploited, to get into the nucleus through the nuclear pores. 
And what are these mechanisms is, is a bit still debated. Uh, but uh, um, you know, there, there is some factor like importing seven, for example. It's a nuclear transfer receptor that helps, and also nuclear, uh, nuclear proteins, nuclear pore proteins that help this uh, uh, process. But we, we identified in 2003 uh, this importing seven, and we wanted to know a bit more about that. So what we did uh, is to use this particular assay, which is called the nuclear import assay, and that has been used, had been used at that point uh, quite a few years, for quite a few years by cell biologists and uh, to uh, understand the nuclear transport of cargoes, of molecules between in and out of the nucleus. And, and what this uh, uh, assay is about, you have a cell, and then you permalize the cells using digitonin. So digitonin only permalizes the plasma membrane because it uh, solubilizes cholesterol. But there is no cholesterol on the nuclear envelope, only on the plasma membrane. So you make, <clears throat> I need to stay close to the microphone, uh, uh, you make holes in the plasma membrane uh, and then, once the cell is, is permalized, you wash out cytosolic content, most of it, and you reconstitute the entire system using either recombinant proteins, or the cytosol in general, just if you want to reconstitute everything, or you just put specific proteins, and then you have maybe a labeled cargo, something that will uh, uh, usually goes into the nucleus, uh, and you study, because it's labeled fluorescently, you study whether these components that you put in back actually stimulating the nuclear transport, nuclear import of these proteins in, in, uh, uh, in the nucleus, exactly. OK, so using this system, uh, we, um, uh, let me go back one second, we uh, purify this HIV reverse subscription complex. So these are complexes inside the cell. You can purify them. The HIV comes in and then makes a complex inside the cell, and we can isolate them, label them fluorescently, and then study their import into the nucleus. So, uh, OK, we, we found important seven. But what we noted, uh, by doing uh, ammonium sulfate precipitation, so you can take, say, cytoplasmic extracts or, or, or a mix of proteins and start separating them by precipitating in ammonium sulfate. And depending on their properties, uh, molecular weight, and so on and so forth, they will either precipitate or not, depending on the concentration of this ammonium salt. They will bind to it and then come down or not come down. And you can see here that we could, uh, with 60% ammonium sulfate, we would precipitate in 14.7. Uh, and uh, in the supernatant, very little was left. So essentially what you do, you add uh, ammonium sulfate up to 60%. What, what precipitates is called the pellet. And what stays uh, in, on the surface, uh, uh, in, in solution, is called the 60SO solution. And you can see that we tested these uh, fractions for activity in nuclear import of the HIV. And you see imported salmon, as expected, does uh, uh, stimulate accumulation of these complexes into the nucleus. But also, there was something in this 60S here that was active. And we knew it was an important seven because that was uh, brought down and precipitated by 60% ammonium sulfate. So what was in here that was active? So that took a little bit of uh, chromatography, biochemistry, uh, fractionation, and so on and so forth. So several steps, but in the end, we got to this uh, last step, which is an ion exchange chromatography. And you separate, you take the fraction, you separate, depending on how the charge of the proteins, they end up in different uh, fractions. And we detected a particular fraction, D and E, that, again, were as active as the starting material. So this is the starting material, then it gets fractionated, and fraction E was really uh, as active as the starting material. So suggesting that the active components actually ended up in fraction E. So what is in fraction E? OK, so one way to look when you do chromatography, you just run, for example, an STS gel, and then you tend to maybe do mass spec cut up the particular bands and analyze them and identify them. And so that's what we, uh, we, we run a gel. Now, this is a, a, um, a silver stain. So you all probably know the difference between a normal Kumasi and a silver stain. Uh, this is why the, the bands here are black. Uh, but if you look in fraction D and E, a particular E was the active one, what color are these bands? Yellowish. Mm -hmm. They're not black. Uh, and this is the starting uh, fraction. So this is not a typical protein. Typical proteins don't uh, stain in that sort of yellowish color. They, they go black. 
And so we, we thought mm, maybe sometimes lipoproteins and glycoproteins uh, uh, get this kind of weak yellowish color. So we really looked into lipoproteins and glycoproteins, sugars, whether this, these proteins had sugars bound, but they didn't have any. So we were stuck for a little while. But uh, really looking again at these gels, you see something there, like a smear. And that, that, that was odd. I mean, how can a protein behave like that and produce this kind of smear? Like so we thought, we had this intuition. So what, what if this active fraction contains nucleic acids instead of proteins? And they, the nucleic acids would, would actually become yellowish under uh, uh, silver stain. So a simple experiment was to test that. And the way you test that is you treat those fractions with protein SK, and protein SK would uh, digest proteins, if there were proteins, or nucleases, and nucleases would kill the nucleic acids if it was nucleic acids. So here you have, uh, this is an SDS, and this is a native gel, and just concentrate on uh, this here. So this is protein SK, the band here is protein SK here, and you mix the fraction E with protein SK, there it is, and fraction E stays pretty much the same. Uh, but if you put nuclease S7, which would digest RNA, DNA, whatever, uh, it, you see that this fraction E is now gone, almost. <coughs> and you can see better here in this native gel where the fraction E is disappeared. So that uh, led us to conclude that this fraction actually contained nucleic acids rather than proteins. And uh, so we run a, a denaturing long gel. This was quite tricky. Anybody who has run this kind of gels know how difficult and thin and how easily they break. Anyway, we run that, and uh, this is the, the fraction original, and you can see there are several bands ranging in size from about 100 nucleotides, 110 nucleotides, to about 20 nucleotides. So which, which of these uh, components is the active one? Uh, so you just cut out these bands one by one, and you can check that you cut out the right the band, and then um, put them at the same concentration uh, in solution, and then tested them in the uh, input acid that I showed you before, and you can see this fraction two, there it is, fraction two, uh, it's the active one. Not because it's the most abundant, because it'll be normalized for some concentration. So it's the active one, because it's really the, the uh, uh, real component that is active. So we decided to clone, obviously it's, it's, it was uh, RNA of about 70-ish, 80-ish nucleotides, and uh, we cloned them. Uh, it wasn't necessarily so straightforward to do that, but anyway, that's the procedure uh, to clone this, uh, this DNA. Uh, sorry, at, the point, at that point, I gave it, I gave it, <laughs> gave it away. We didn't, know. <laughs> we didn't know what they were. But anyway, we cloned them, and the sequencing, so we cloned about 100, 100, 100 of them, and they came back. And this is the sequence. Some of them were truncated, but enough, uh, they were enough to do a uh, blast search and you know, um, uh, look for what they were. And uh, all they were were DNA. So to be honest, at the beginning, we really thought these were contaminants. They, they must be contaminants. And we must be missing the right stuff that is the active stuff. Uh, and we were convinced. But yet, you know, and the more we cloned, the more DNA came out. OK, so um, let me. So that was obviously a little surprising because we had this TNA that would uh, promote the, the nuclear transport of the HIV related subscription complexes. What's going on here? Mm, didn't make much sense. But if you look at studies published in the late 70s and uh, early 80s by quite a variety of different groups, so this, this is reliable data, you know, accepted in the field, no question about that. Uh, and actually, uh, retroviruses incorporate tRNAs. They incorporate a lot of them uh, up to, so these are 2D gels showing these dots, and these dots are actually tRNAs. And these are purified uh, viral particles, and you can run these 2D gels and see these particular tRNAs. But what do you see here? Uh, that these dots are actually not quite the same, right? They're quite different from here. MMTV to gross uh, uh, MLV to Moloney MLV, etc. There are different dots. And that suggests that these different dots are different tRNAs. So uh, different viruses, up to three to three, 600 molecules of tRNA, recent calculations using RNA sequencing uh, uh, sort of came up with this number. It seems to me quite high, I have to say, but you know, uh, we believe them. Uh, so they incorporate different tRNAs, different retroviruses, and in particular, TR, uh, HIV-1 preferentially incorporates tRNA lysine. 
uh, Lysin 3 and Lysin 1 2. And Lysin 1 2, Lysin 3 is the primer for reverse transcription, and Lysin 1 2 not, but it incorporates loads of them. Okay, so <clears throat> if that is the case, so if tRNAs are incorporated into the viral particles, could it be that this tRNA, when the viral particle comes in, uh, the core is partially disassembled. We don't know exactly when, but at a certain point it has to happen. And these tRNAs present in the uh, viral particle are exposed to the cellular environment, and maybe they are the one who help HIV going in, back into the nucleus. Somehow, we didn't, we didn't know how, but somehow that could be the explanation. So what we did was to take uh, HIV-1 particles or a mutant uh, HIV-1 particles that wouldn't go into the nucleus. Okay? Uh, we extracted the tRNA from these particles. Here they are. Uh, this is the uh, HIV normal one. Uh, this is the typical lysine 1, 2 uh, signature on the gel. And this is the mutant particles that doesn't go into the nucleus. And you see that is a bit different in terms of composition of the tRNA. So we, we took these tRNAs uh, from the gel, eluted them, and then tested them in the same import assay that we used before. Uh, and you can see here that the tRNA coming from there do support the uh, import of the HIV complex, but the tRNA coming from there, they don't. So suggesting that those tRNA that were incorporated into the particles were actually active, active components. They could somehow uh, uh, stimulate that process. So tRNA lysing one to incorporate into HIV promotes nuclear. Now, if that is the case, then how would that work? Um, could they be adapters, this tRNA? Uh, they could adapt to some other things uh, so that the HIV is visible to, to a machinery that imports them. Or another wild hypothesis was at that time was maybe these tRNAs are actually imported themselves back into the nucleus. So there is a mechanism, a pathway in cells for a re so-called retrograde transport of tRNA back into the nucleus. And so to test that, uh, we, what we did was uh, synthesize tRNA. You can do that in vitro, uh, poll free You synthesize them. They're obviously they're a bit different because they're not modified, so there's that. Uh, and then label them and then test them in the same assay. And you can see here that this uh, tRNA, uh, artificial synthesized tRNA, accumulates in the nuclei really well, provided you give energy. Without energy, it does not happen. It simply does not happen. So if you get an energy, and then we generated a number of mutants, I won't go into the details here, but the number of mutants that disrupt the, the secondary structure or the third, third, tertiary structure of the tRNA, and, the, and, and this tRNA were no longer able to be imported. So not only dependent on energy, but was dependent on a particular structure of the tRNA. And not only was energy dependent, but it was also temperature dependent. So, um, and also, it was um, uh, saturable. So here you, you can compete. Uh, this is a tRNA labeled with YoYo1, uh, and this is the cold uh, competitor. And you can see that the more cold competitor you put, the, the, the less there is import. And it's a competition is specific. So, so we have something that is energy dependent, that is temperature dependent, and that then is saturable. So the three together indicate that it must be a carrier-mediated active process. Right, so this is uh, a fairly, now a fairly old paper that we published uh, summarizing all this finding, and the idea is that the HIV comes in, the core is partially disassembled, this tRNA that are incorporated into the HIV particles are exposed into the cellular milieu, to the cellular milieu, the, and there is a machinery here in the cell, pre-existing obviously to HIV infection, that import the tRNA in an active way from the cytoplasm back into the nucleus, and this machinery is exploited by HIV to get it to the nucleus. Now, it took us a really long time to publish this paper. Uh, we, we did claim that there was some evidence that some tRNA species can be imported into the nucleus in human cells and promote HIV infection, and it really took us a long time because it was not accepted. The, the, the idea, the concept that tRNA would go back, and why would they go back, and why there was a, a pathway in the cell 
an active part in the cell to, to sort of re-import back the, the, the RNA in the nucleus wasn't, wasn't really safe. So a long time, I, I think a, a, about almost two years to, to get it in. Uh, but uh, luckily, uh, at the same time, uh, several papers were published. And uh, this pathway was now discovered in yeast. So obviously it was conserved. It was something conserved from yeast to mammalian cells to human cells. Uh, so our colleague in Japan and Anita in the States found this in S. Cedizia. Um, and later on, Anita confirmed the finding in, uh, in mammalian cells, in rat hepatoma cells. And this pathway is, is also conserved in Artemia and is, for example, found in uh, trypanosoma. So it's actually a, probably a fundamental pathway that is there uh, conserved through evolution. Right, so first part was about this pathway, but what is this pathway for and how is this regulated? To um, find out a bit more about that, we developed an assay, uh, which is a fluorescent in situ hybridization assay. So this is called TFISH, TRNA uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization. And essentially, it's a, a probe that is homologous to the tRNA, and the probe has a deoxygenin uh, that is, can be recognized by a fluorescently labeled um, antibody. Not particularly complex. Uh, so this is, um, it, um, I hope you can see that. Anyway, this, this, is, this is the results of preliminary uh, controls for the T-fish. And you can see here that the tRNA are mostly located in the cytoplasm, as you would expect. You wouldn't find much, at least by T-fish in the nucleus. Uh, this is the DAPI. Uh, and we tested HeLa cells, uh, um, neonatal human derma fibroblast, uh, and the primary CD T cells, uh, CD3 positive T cells. And you can see this cytoplasm in the nucleus. You, we, te we used as a control uh, U5 small nuclear RNA, uh, because it's all, all, all only in the nucleus. It's located only there. So it's, is uh, uh, visible there, and it shows uh, it showed us it's a control because it showed that the probe actually can reach the nucleus, and it's not a given, you know, when you do fish that it, tRNA uh, RNA fish that it goes into the nucleus, and this is a control, a negative control, a tRNA that has homology, no homology or very little homology to any human tRNA, and is negative. Okay, so what we did was to test. So the hypothesis that we had is that if there is a mechanism to transport tRNA back into the nucleus, it could be linked to regulation of protein translation. Uh, because obviously, protein translation, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, depends on the availability of tRNA in the cytoplasm. And if you then reduce the availability of tRNA in the cytoplasm by importing them back into the nucleus, where there is no protein translation going on, obviously, you change the balance there, and you can reduce protein translation. So protein um, modulation of protein translation, as Yvonne no, Yvette knows very well, is dependent on response to stress. For example, one of the main mechanisms that modulates protein translation is response to stress. So we tested uh, uh, different stresses. And here they are. So we tested oxidative stress, genotoxic stress, translational inhibition by pyromycin, metabolic stress, glucose deprivation, and we also tested amino acid deprivation. We tested viral infection, inflammation, heat shock, and, and so on and so forth. And this is a summary of what we found. So oxidative stress, and we tested in the three cell types, and oxidative stress uh, was the most uh, sort of uh, potent, potent inducer of this pathway. Uh, other other uh, pyromycin did that, uh, and genotoxic stress to an extent did that, but, but oxidative stress was the only one that uh, acted on all three cell types, so it was quite broad. And the others were more, a little bit more cell type specific. And, and these are some of the pictures, some of the examples. Uh, you see this is um, normal, in normal condition, control cells, and then you do a T-fish, so the tRNA is in the cytoplasm, and then you add H2O2, and we'll, we'll discuss about the concentration here later on, uh, and you see this accumulation. Uh, these, are, these now are endogenous tRNA, so not, these are not the tRNA that we may synthesize and add to the primalized cells. Now, these are real cells. Uh, and you see accumulation of this tRNA, uh, oxidative stress, MMS to an extent in, in T cells, and also a little bit in, in HeLa cells. So MMS is a genotoxic stress, is a, is a compound. Puromycin did that, but glucose deprivation, interferon alpha, TNF alpha, not much, at least not, we couldn't detect. We, we were not convinced. If we see something, we were not really convinced by it. 
Um, so here you see that a time course and is fast, is relatively fast, so it would fit with the stress response in terms of timing. Uh, you see uh, starting about one hour and reaching a peak of two hours, uh, two to three hours. Uh, so this is, um, let me explain to you what this graph means. This is a nucleocytoplasmic ratio of, this, of the intensity of the signal. So the higher it is, the more signal there is in the nucleus. So here we're looking at accumulation in the nucleus uh, compared to uh, zero, zero time. And this is MMS and this is puromycin. You see puromycin is much faster. And I think simply because puromycin um, um, uh, is maybe faster inducing the stress response. It blocks protein synthesis elongation. This, all these uh, polypeptides cannot fold properly, and they are uh, stress induced quickly. Now, this is uh, in terms of oxidative stress uh, induced by uh, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And this is how much we needed to induce uh, the oxidative stress maximum uh, reached at about 5 millimolar. After 5 millimolar, the cells suffer a bit. So we couldn't go much higher than that. So obviously, you have to, to induce stress. is always a bit difficult because you have to induce stress. And if you induce a little bit too much, then the cell turns to apoptosis and they tend to die. And if you induce too little, there is very little effect. So you have to find the right balance, the right time, and the right concentration. So here it is, uh, five, uh, two and a half, you see something, and then 5 millimolar, you see. Right, uh, so the same results in T cells. Uh, you can see here accumulation of this tRNA. Much more difficult to look in T cells. It's really tiny, and you know to be able to measure how much signal there is in the cytoplasm and the nucleus is really is really difficult. So this is why we are not showing any graph there because we couldn't really sort of work out precisely what is the difference between you know the cytoplasm there and the nucleus there. But visually, we were convinced that there was accumulation of tRNA in the nucleus compared to the control, so although we couldn't really measure it very accurately. Uh, and you needed a little less, a little less uh, H2O2 to induce the response, presumably because these were primary cells, and the others were semi-primary or HeLa, I mean, it's like a, a cell line. So, so, and it's a cancer, remember, it's a cancer cell line. So maybe cancer, <coughs> Uh, uh, inducing response, uh, a stress response in cancer, it's harder uh, because they, they don't respond that way. Okay, now one question was, okay, so was this because we blocked by uh, 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 putting on, ox uh, 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 giving oxidative stress, did we block export of tRNA from the nucleus? In that case, you would see accumulation there, yeah? Or was it due to re-import of existing tRNA in the cytoplasm back into the nucleus? A quite an important question. So to do that, what we did to test that, uh, it's possible to treat the cells with actinomycin D. And that is a drug that blocks uh, synthesis of RNA, including R uh, all, all, all RNA polymerase, all of them. Uh, one, uh, two, uh, polymerase two, polymerase three. Uh, and you can see by treatment with actinomycin D, we really reduced the amount of messenger RNA of several, several, um, several genes. And then what we did was, okay, so here is the control conditions, and then we put actinomycin D, uh, we, we stress them, so we accumulate the tRNA into the nucleus, with or without actinomycin D. So you can see here that even if we had actinomycin D for two or even four hours, before, before we did the uh, stress, uh, we could see easily accumulation in the nucleus. What does that mean? That uh, new tRNA that were synthesized in the nucleus were, sorry, new tRNA were not synthesized in the nucleus, okay? So obviously, if there was no new tRNA in the nucleus, they could not be exported out. And, um, and you can see here that despite everything that we did, we still see accumulation of this tRNA. So they cannot, it's not a question of blocking uh, new tRNA synthesizing nucleus, blocking them getting out, because there was no tRNA, no tRNA new tRNA synthesizing nucleus. It was a question of this uh, tRNA in the cytoplasm going back there. And you can see this is quantification of the signal. So this is truly a retrograde transport rather than blocking the exit. And most of the RNA, so we did an ER tracking, an ER tracker, so this is a, a labeling uh, specific for the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. 
Uh, and you can see uh, that this is a double labeling. So this is TFISH plus, um, plus ER uh, tracking. And you can see that when uh, we induced TRNA retrocar transport using H2O2, uh, the, uh, this is the ER, the, the, the empty, so the, the most empty part of the cell was, was where the ER is. So presumably, uh, presumably, those TRNA that are important to nutrients come from the ER, rather than most of them, rather than those TRNA that are in, diffused in the cytoplasm. And also what we found was the process is reversible. It's quite important because, ER, uh, because uh, stress response are usually reversible unless you sort of tip the balance. And when you tip the balance, uh, you have cell death. But if you didn't tip the balance and the conditions are restored, uh, then the cell, the, essentially the ER stress is a way to allow cell survival, at least for a certain amount of time if the conditions are right. And if the conditions are, 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 are right, then the ER stress recedes and the cells carries on and survive. So reversibility of the process is quite key. And so that's what we tested. We induced uh, TRNA retrograde spark transport by H2O2. And then we washed out uh, H2O2. So we restored normal conditions. And then we looked uh, what happened to these TRNAs. And you can see that after five minutes already, uh, there's less accumulation of the RNA in the nucleus, and by 10, 15 minutes, they're all out, back again. So obviously, they are exported out. Whatever is imported in is exported out, uh, and this is the curve. So it's a reversible process. Good. So next question. Uh, which DNAs are imported into the nucleus? Are they all of them or some of them, uh, some more than others? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. And so to, to understand that, what we did was uh, induce uh, retrograde transport. And then we fractionated the cell into a nucle nucleus and cytosol. And then we sequenced enriched for small RNA, gel, you just run the gel and cut out the, the, the right band. Uh, and then we did a particular uh, um, a reverse description. So obviously, because these tRNA are highly modified and they are difficult, uh, you need a special enzyme. And this is the this is new technique. is a new technique developed not by us but by, by people who work on tRNA and sequence them. And they, so we, we adapted this and we sequenced them and then we uh, looked at what they are. So here is the control for the fractionation. So these are the cells fractionation, and you can see here, uh, this is a cytosolic enzyme. And uh, uh, this is a mostly cytosolic enzyme. We did see a little bit of gut, uh, gut DH in the nucleus. And this is lamin, which is only nuclear, so the fractionation worked well in terms of a least protein, protein distribution. And then we looked at the, what uh, RNAs were present in the two fraction, excluding the tRNAs, because the, 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 the nuclear tRNAs, because those are the test. So we excluded them. And uh, uh, you see that in the nucleus are mostly uh, nuclear uh, short, uh, small RNAs. So that made sense. These are the, the top hits. And in the cytosolic fraction, they were mostly uh, mitochondrial tRNAs. So, so kind of we were reassured that the, the fractionation worked. Uh, at least work well enough to proceed with uh, the analysis. So here are the reads, the number of reads, uh, the, 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 the reads that we could map to messenger RNA, non-coding RNA, and tRNAs. Unfortunately, replicate free, this is a, these are biological replicates, so they were done, they were done uh, separately, right? Unfortunately, number three didn't work that well. We couldn't map a lot of reads, so uh, so that was a little bit of a problem, unfortunately, for the statistical power. And, and, and only, I'll show you later, but only a few of these tRNAs actually reached statistical significance because, because we lost a part of most of one sample still. Um, that's, that's life. Um, and, and really, we didn't have the funds at that point to repeat the whole thing. So we, we had to do with it. You know. um, anyway, so this, uh, so we mapped, we mapped the reads and looked at the, uh, the differences. And, uh, and you can see, so this is the cytoplasm in control or, or treated, control or treated, nucleus control, treated, control, treated. And you can see that, particularly in the nucleus, uh, you see changes. You see this uh, pinkish, horrible color, I have to say, this pinkish that really goes up in, in the nucleus. And also this bluish here 
it, it tends to go up. So, so there are uh, differences. Uh, not all of the TRNA change. Some of them, in fact, are fewer. Uh, there are fewer of them in the nucleus. So there, there are all sorts of uh, things going on. But certain things are reproducible, obviously. So it's possible to do a heat map. And here, here they are. So these are uh, nucleus, nucleus. These are intact. So we looked at the, the TRNA that had the CCA tail and the TRNA that didn't because they were partially degraded. And you can see that mostly in the nucleus, there is an accumulation of these uh, TRNAs that lack a certain number of nucleotides in the free prime end. And so presumably there is a process of degradation that happens uh, simultaneously with the import or uh, uh, in the nucleus. We, we don't know that yet, uh, but that's what's happening. And you can see that some, for some of them there is a significant fold change, nucleus cytoplasmic. So there are accumulating in the nucleus in these conditions. And um, the, uh, so what this suggested, uh, if you go back here, uh, you know, if you look at these, uh, it suggested that there is a kind of selectivity. Not all the TRNAs are imported with the same efficiency. Some are, are imported back into the nucleus better than others. And, uh, and, and we, uh, it's possible to confirm that by using northern block. So you see here accumulation of these uh, defective TRNAs in the nucleus, here again, there. Uh, but for example, you don't, uh, uh, SEC is, accumulates in the nucleus, you see there, um, and, but some of them don't. So for example, glycine is not great here, you can see that not much accumulation in the nucleus. Uh, so there is selectivity, and we could confirm that. Which means that certain TRNAs are imported, certain TRNAs are not imported that well. So that will change the abundance of specific TRNAs in the cytoplasm. So it's rapid, it's reversible, uh, cell type dependent, oxidative stress, and it's selected. How is it regulated? So in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to go through uh, uh, regulation. Or at least we started, OK? We, we haven't completed the investigation yet. But we started looking at that. So going back to ER stress, um, we know that these are different pathways that respond to hypoxia. So we, we were obviously looking, first of all, into oxidative stress. What pathways are triggered by oxidative stress? So there is HIF. Uh, HIF is a transcription factor. In case of hypoxia, this is uh, stabilized. HIF is stabilized, usually degraded really quickly. So the levels, steady state levels are pretty low, but uh, in, present, in the presence of hypoxia, this is stabilized and is a transcription factor that regulates Nobel Prize uh, this year, in fact, uh, for HIF, oops, this has gone too fast, um, and then we have uh, ATF6, IR1, we discussed that, and then uh, PERC, PERC phosphorylates the F2 uh, alpha, uh, and also we have mTOR, uh, which regulates cell metabolism and is also uh, inhibited by hypoxia. So obviously, if there is hypoxia, cells want to reduce their metabolic activity. They want to slow down, slow down and see whether the situation improves, and then if it improves, it will uh, carry on uh, doing uh, protein uh, synthesis, but otherwise they really have to sort of, sort of slow down. So we did a test of a number of these pathways. I won't show you all, all the data that they're, they're in, uh, in the paper. Um, I'll show you, for example, um, uh, HIF because uh, uh, HIF is not stabilized in our conditions by H2O2 in, in, in our experimental uh, situations. But what we see was a clear phosphorylation of uh, EF2 alpha. So that was prominent and it was present all the time, very reproducible. So that was a key for us uh, to sort of understand the regulation of this uh, step. So uh, EF2 alpha, it's, act, it's phosphorylated by several kinases. It can be phosphorylated by these kinases. So we tested uh, them uh, one by one, particularly GNC2, PKR. This is, this is a kinase that is only present in particular cell types, so not the cell types that we were investigating. So we didn't really, really spend too much time on that. Uh, GNC2 in yeast is called a long name in human cells, EF2 AK4. Uh, we uh, done regulated by sRNA this protein, and we still see phosphorylation EF2 uh, alpha and still see retrograde uh, tRNA accumulation. So obviously, it's not that. Uh, same thing with uh, PKR. We inhibited PKR. We could still see uh, uh, PF2 alpha activation, even with a lot of the inhibitor, and we could still see accumulation tRNA, so we tested PERC, uh, and using an inhibitor, a GSK inhibitor of PERC, quite selective, actually, we could see 
a, a, a reduction uh, of tyranine retrograde transport, a reduction also in phosphorylation of uh, PF, uh, F2 alpha, although I have to say Western blot is not particularly uh, sort of sensitive in terms of uh, quantitation. So, uh, but anyway, we, we did see a reduction in phosphorylation and a reduction in the signal, which did not go back exactly to baseline, but there was a, a significant effect. In fact, this is, this is significant between uh, this and, and this and that. Okay, uh, so we also looked, because the other branch is mTOR, so we looked at the mTOR pathway. In our conditions, mTOR was inhibited, and you can test that by checking the phosphorylation of 4-EBP and phosphorylation of the S6 ribosomal protein, and so it was definitely uh, uh, inhibited in our conditions. And then we did... Um, uh, 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 gene expression profiling in, in the presence of in the, our conditions, and you could see that some of these uh, genes were down-regulated. This, uh, this is the mTOR pathway, so, so we focused on the mTOR pathway in particular, and there is one gene that actually was uh, significantly, so this is the significant threshold, one, one gene that was uh, significantly up-regulated uh, and is this uh, red one. And red one Red one is in fact one of the genes that is upregulated by ATF4, and ATF4 is a transcription factor that depends on the UPR uh, stress response. So there is a link. There is a possibly a link between UPR, the ER stress response, and the mTOR pathway. So uh, here it is. So this is hypoxia, and the red one is actually a sensor of hypoxia. Uh, quite upstream in the pathway, and red one would upregulate uh, TSC, tuberous sclerosis 1, 2, which would then inhibit the rehab, and rehab is an activator on the mTOR pathway. Net result, if you don't have red one, you have reduced activity of, of mTOR. Let's simply put it that way. Okay, so uh, is red one an important sensor for tRNA retrograde transport? Uh, so we uh, got some meth knockout cells from our collaborator James, uh, James Bulgarolis in the States. They generated these knockout mice. They survived, so that's okay. And um, uh, you can see here that this is normal, normal mouse cells and there is retrograde transport even in mouse cells. Good to know, uh, good to sort of confirm that. Uh, but in the red uh, negative cells, knockout cells, there is much less of it. And you can see this is the response and actually there is no response in the red negative cells. So red one seems to be an important, perhaps not the only one, but certainly an important regulator of this process. Okay, so to summarize, this is the, the, the paper that was published uh, just a few months ago. What we think is going on is that uh, uh, H2O2 induces ER stress that activates PERC, uh, PERC uh, phosphorylates AF2 alpha, this may act, uh, induce ATF4, uh, uh, red one is upregulated, mTOR is inhibited, and then somehow, we don't know how yet, but somehow certain tRNAs are imported back into the nucleus. And what is the significance of this? I, I talked to you about this tRNA retrograde transport, but what is the significance? Well, uh, uh, actually, if you have a selective depletion of certain tRNAs in the cytoplasm, you're bound to reprogram protein translation, because suddenly you find that the so-called tRNA adaptation index is changed. What is the tRNA adaptation index? Is how well adapted is your pool of tRNA in the cytoplasm compared to the messenger RNA that you have? So messenger RNA have certain codons, and if those codons cannot be recognized by the, the tRNA because the tRNA is not there or is much less, then that particular messenger RNA cannot be translated or can be translated much slower. On the other hand, if you have messenger RNA that are very well adapted to the pool of tRNA that you have in those particular conditions, then those tRNA will be translated much faster, preferentially, let's put it that way. So this is our hypothesis, is what tRNA retrograde transport is doing, is one, another layer to regulate the uh, sort of uh, control and modulate protein translation. And this has significance, um, as we discussed today with uh, Yvette, because uh, uh, you have um, viruses, for example, that um, uh, uh, induce oxidative stress. They induce uh, UPR, they induce the stress response. 
So one question is, do uh, viruses, and particularly I'm thinking about RNA viruses, more than DNA viruses, uh, are these viruses adapted to TRNA retrograde transport, for example? Are their, their codons adapted to the pool of, the, of tRNA that are present in the cytoplasm during oxidative stress? And something that, to address that, first we need to uh, figure out what is the tRNA adaptation index during, uh, in our conditions, consequence of tRNA retrograde transport, and then we can go back to these viral genomes and sort of uh, analyze that. But, uh, uh, so these are, these are the questions that, that uh, I think this, this uh, research opens up. But there is also, it's also interesting for general immunology, I think, because again, uh, uh, stress, oxidative stress, but other kinds of stresses, they also affect uh, substantially the way these uh, uh, cells respond uh, to stimuli, but also they respond, for example, to uh, uh, activation and, and recognize uh, their antigens and respond to uh, antigenic stimulation. So one question is, could that be also a way uh, the, uh, regulation of, of this protein translation by tyrannical tra transport could, could also be a way to regulate, um, um, uh, modulate protein translation in, uh, in, uh, in immune cells. So I'll finish here. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions. And I would like to thank, uh, first of all, Hagen, who really sort of uh, drove this, this, this project. He set up the TRNA fish and done a lot of work. Alex Chu, a student in my lab, is now at uh, Harvard. Uh, and Tamara, who is now uh, at Heidelberg, uh, doing a PhD. And then our collaborators, Mala Maini, uh, Laura Pallet, and uh, Dan did a lot of um, the sequencing, uh, sequencing for us. And also uh, Frank and Thomas, Frank Hewling and Thomas Baumert, who are the sort of expert in terms of TNA alignment and sequencing and identification and so on and so forth. Uh, and the founders. So, thanks very much for your attention, and I have to take questions. Be drilled. <laughs>